I am extremely happy to be speaking with you today, a topic that is very different from our usual fare <laughs> here on American Thought Leaders. Either sign off. <laughs> yes, not that. <laughs> right, right. No, and and frankly, free range parenting, you know, it's almost become I don't has it become a dictionary word now? It is. I, I don't mean, know. A dictionary, yeah, yeah. You have a statistic, okay? Uh, and I, I have to start us off here because I thought that was fascinating. You basically said you were talking in this fil in the film uh, Chasing Childhood, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. I just watched it. You said something like, you know, crime has been going down. And statistically, for someone's child to be uh, uh, yeah. ab abducted, it would take something like 750,000 well, years. You're stepping on the punchline here, man. <laughs> you got to ask somebody, hey, Jan, so how long do you think it would take, if you left your kid outside, how long do you think it would take before they could be, they'd be abducted by a stranger? And then when I ask this to audiences, you know, people raise their hand and they say, I don't know, uh, you know, 24 hours, and some people say 20 minutes, some people think two minutes. I mean, it's really, and then once in a while, somebody will say 10 years. And I'll say, well, you're close, except that it actually is, statistically, uh, if you wanted your kid to be kidnapped by a stranger, how long would you have to keep them out there to, for it to be likely to happen? And the answer is, as you were saying, <laughs> 750,000 years. And, you know, after the first 100,000 or so, they're not really a kid anymore. <laughs> I'm not even sure if their bones are left there. But anyways, it's, it's a very long time. And I love my statistic because it tries to put into perspective just how rare this crime is that sort of dominates our brains. But I've found in years and years of talking about it, not 750, but a long time, um, it doesn't really change things. Unfortunately, you can, you can be as... Um, as well versed as you like in the numbers and uh, reality, and it doesn't change people's fears, alas. Well, I mean, it's fascinating. So some years ago, and I kind of, I vaguely remember this happening, right? Uh, you wrote a column, basically, <laughs> yeah. that, that why I let my nine-year-old ride, uh, ride the, the sub subway alone, yes. You got in big trouble. Yes. Yeah, and, but now I guess the big question is, why, you know, why did you get in big trouble? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and and how has that changed? And I guess that's the topic of, of our episode today. How? Or, so um, the reason I got in trouble is because I said out loud um, two days after I wrote the column, which was in the New York Sun. I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR. Fox News and NPR. <laughs> you know, so not a political thing here. It was interesting to everyone uh, defending myself. And I got the nickname America's Worst Mom, which is always fun to show somebody if you're sitting next to them on the bus. I'm like, Google America's Worst Mom. They, do their, <laughs> they think I'm going to kill them. Um, but the reason I got into trouble is because when I was on these shows, I said, listen, I, I didn't do it because I don't care about my kid living or dying. Um, I did it because I trust him. I trust the city. I trust strangers. And I didn't go to the very darkest place because I was constantly asked, like to this day, asked, but what if he had never come home? That's what they always asked. And it's like, you, you, he did. <laughs> Why are we talking about that? And it's like, if you're not thinking about that worst case scenario as a parent, you're considered um, evil. You're considered in denial at best and um, absolutely uncaring and heartless at worst because somehow the, 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 the literally the knee jerk thing we're supposed to do these days is imagine our kids dead and it's all our fault. I mean, I, I know I'm putting it pretty baldly and I haven't drawn you there slowly with a lot of arguments and discussion and we'll get there. But really, I was gonna write a book called Stop, Stop Imagining Your Kids Dead because that's really become a, an obsession of American parents and I'd say the media. Well, and, and it's fascinating. It, also in the film, um, I, I think it's uh, Dr. Peter Gray that mm -hmm. talks about we're kind of living in a, social experiment because for all of human history right. essentially right. children had considerable freedom aside from you know sure. child slavery and some of oh, these yeah. horrible horrible you know scenarios but for, for the majority of history but today and frankly in like one or two generations I think you say one I think I've, I'm counting two um, something really changed dramatically 
Uh, exactly what you're saying. Um, Peter Gray, who's one of the co-founders with me of Let Grow, which is the nonprofit I run, trying to bring independence back to childhood. Um, he ha he's an evolutionary psychologist, teaches at Boston College, and he has studied play, you know, throughout history and its role in kids' lives. It's how kids learn to make something happen. It's how they learn to get along. It's how they learn to compromise. It's how they learn to hold themselves together so that they don't have to go home a, a crying mess and can keep playing whatever game they're playing. And we have replaced that with something that might look like play, but it's really adult run, and that's what's so different. I mean, if you're going to you know, lacrosse or soccer or kumon or chess, whatever it is, there's an adult showing, okay, this is, this is what you're going to do now, and when you're done, I'll evaluate it, and you know, we can all have fun, and we can have snacks at the end. But there's no chance for the kids to figure out all the messiness of how to get along. And to take that out of kids' lives, which is an instinct that was put in there that's it's as deeply embedded and as important to the human species as the drive to procreate, right? I mean, you know, you want to keep the species going. And one way Mother Nature made that happen is by putting this drive to play into kids so that they will learn about their environment and figure out how to deal with things. And, and one of the examples that uh, another play expert, a guy named Stuart Brown, talks about is that all animals play. And like a gazelle, they, when they're very little, they start you know, look, doing what looks like tag, right? I mean, like one is running and the other's chasing and then they turn around and the other one's chasing them. And it's like, that's stupid, right? I mean, there's the gazelle out in the field where a lion can get them, right? And they're wasting all their energy. They're gonna have to eat way more gazelle chow. And why, why is there that instinct to do that when they could just be saying, you know, quit sitting quietly next to their moms and reading a, you know, a, a wonderful book? And the reason that Mother Nature made them do that is because they need that even more. They need that time playing and interacting with the other animals and the environment for them to, to survive as a species. And that's the same with us, and we're not doing it. We are giving kids a lot of chance to be good students, whether it's of baseball or in the classroom, but we're not giving them a chance to come up with anything on their own and make it happen. You know, I've been in through the history, I guess the fairly short history of American thought leaders of this show. I've interviewed a lot of people on a lot of topics, but one topic which I haven't really talked to anyone about until today is just, is I, the only way to call it is a safetyist culture. Yeah that has developed. And I think, you know, these things are deeply connected. It's not just for kids, right? right? That right, there's right. this safetyism, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that's been on my mind. And I think it feeds into a lot of concerning social phenomena that I'm seeing. Let's just talk about what I was reading today, because today I was writing a piece on there was a New York Times article called, uh, you know, there's a column called Modern Love. And this one woman was writing about how her husband became obsessed with danger, every danger that could possibly face their child. When the baby was four months old and there was a little spot on the kid's lips, the dad went and Googled it and he was convinced that this was cancer and the child was going to die. And when they were growing their blueberries in the backyard, he's convinced that the ground is leached with chemicals and they can't eat those blueberries or he'll die. And he put some wood in their wood burning oven, which I think is scarier than anything if a kid's going to touch the wood burning oven. But anyways, he put the wood in there and he realized it was, un, you know, it was wood that was like old scrap wood and maybe it had arsenic in it. And he was convinced the child was going to die. And they finally went to a, you know, a shrink who helped him realize that this, this is um, obsessive compulsive disorder. You're convinced that everything leads to death and that it's all your fault. And I was like, he's not the only one. I mean, because you're in a society that is telling you almost every day that almost everything that your child is doing could be a disaster unless you are hyper vigilant. And so I decided, let me look up, like, what's the latest thing that the Consumer Protection, CPSC, Consumer Product Safety Commission, is warning parents about? And last month, you know, the most recent thing that I thought was interesting that they were warning parents about was little socks with, for your child, with a pom-pom on the ankle. Why was this dangerous? Um, they can swallow it, gets lodged in their, th in their throat. What, Just the whole a wild, sock wild or? guess, the pom-pom. The pom-pom, you're, my God, you're, there's a job waiting for you in DC, there you go. Exactly that, and I'm thinking like, by the time you have an entire government agency warning you that pom-poms are deadly, 
there's something amiss, right? And then I decided I went a little back further on the, on the CPSC uh, site. And it, last month, the month before, it had warned about um, some kitty sandals because like one of the little toggles could fall off. And once again, that posed a threat. Choking hazard, yes, close, <laughs> okay. close. But I mean, you know, really, it's, it's almost a parlor game, except that people are really being driven crazy. Come up with a reason.